This has been a long year. A year of uncertainty, struggle, pain. We've watched a virus take countless lives. People we knew, people we loved. Jobs have been lost. Businesses have shut down. And churches have been forced to close their doors. We've witnessed division on an unprecedented level. Cities filled with violence. Streets filled with protesters. And we felt the sting of racism. The deep heartache of hate. There have been times where it's been difficult to see the hand of God. But even in the darkest of moments, He has been there, faithful, present, powerful. As a new year begins, we stand on a simple truth. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They'll soar on wings as eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not grow faint. We don't know what this new year will hold, but we know that it's held by a God whose mercies are new every morning. This is where we place our trust. This is the truth on which we stand. This is our hope for the new year.
I needed rescue. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken. Happy New Year! It's 2021. Are you ready? Well, it's good to have you with us today if you're joining us in this room or online. Our dear senior pastor is on vacation, and if anybody deserves a vacation, it's our senior pastor. Would you praise the Lord for Pastor Chad and for his family? We have a special guest this morning. Our pastor emeritus, Steve Dighton, is here to bring the word. He and his dear wife, Mary, are on the front row. It's good to see you. He was singing and pointing. It's good to see you. If you don't know Pastor Steve, you should, and you'll be blessed. What a year. Are you tired of masks? Oh, my heavens. Some of us look better. Um, <laughs> and tired of social distancing. But as the video reminds us, we've been through a lot. But we're people of the book. And many years ago, the hymn writer said this, Horatio Spafford, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, say it with me, it is well.
I know Pastor Chad would say that it's an incredible privilege to open God's Word, and this morning we get to hear Pastor Steve do just the same. I'm sure Pastor Bill would say it's a privilege to lead you in worship. There's a privilege that I get on occasion, and that is to tell you how good God has been through your faithfulness, and that's what I'm going to do right now. Are you ready for this? You know, to, to, we get to report on domestic missions and international missions and where we're going and where we're giving, more so giving last year than going. But this morning, it's my privilege to give you a report on your faithfulness, God's goodness, to the international missions community that we have been supporting this year. Do you know, this year, in spite of everything, we will give the largest percentage of our offerings ever to international missions from 2020. It's as if God knew you're not going to need it here. They're going to need it there. And he paved the way for this. So here's a little report for you. Strap it in. Here we go. Number one, Empower One needed Bibles. You know why they needed Bibles? Because so many Muslims are coming to faith in Christ. And we were able to send them hundreds and hundreds of Bibles so that they will have God's word in their hand. We were able to meet some specific needs that Project Hope had. Um, we've been working with them for years, as you know, one of our largest partners. And they're getting up and running in Haiti so that they can host us when we return prayerfully in March this year. Tim and Trina Johnson operate La Casa Grande Ministries in the Dominican Republic. And some of you remember them because we've been building chapels with them in the DR for years. We were able to send them a gift as well in the hope that they'll be able to host more missions groups in 2021. And on top of that, as we prayed through the Eve services and committed all of our offerings on those services to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, we will give a gift this year, which is nearly triple the size, the largest that we've ever given to Lottie Moon in the amount of $150,000, which will support those 3,500 faithful gospel workers all around the world. Has God been good? I would say he has. Let's thank him this morning as we continue our worship. 
Father, it is an incredible privilege to see you work. Not only to see you work, but to be invited in to work alongside of you. You paved a way for so many great things to happen last year, and we would be remiss for not giving you praise for that work. And this morning, as we give these gifts and we celebrate the gifts that have been given, Father, we pray for these partners. We pray for the, pray for the work in the Arab countries. We pray for the work in the, in the Caribbean. Father, I pray for what you're doing in Central and South America. Lord, I thank you for the 3,500 faithful workers who are out on the field or preparing to go back to the field. And thank you, as Paul thanked you throughout Scripture, we thank you for the opportunity to give. It is our privilege, and we are excited to see you work. We do all of this, and we say thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Well, amen and amen. <clears throat> it's great to be with you today, church. Thank you for that wonderful worship, Bill. And uh, I'm Pastor Steve Dighton. I know most of you in this room, but I don't know everyone in this room. It's always great to be back and certainly appreciate Pastor Chad giving me an invitation to come and preach this first Sunday of the new year. And I agree with Bill. Uh, Chad's probably, as much as anyone I know, deserving of a uh, some time off, and I know he'll come back ready and anxious to uh, lead the church in the days to come. And we rejoice with you. Thank you for that good report, Jim, about what the church has done regarding this uh, really uh, great giving during the, 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 the season when you would least expect it, but that's what God does in our life, and he is faithful and he is for us. So today I want to preach for me from God's Word. So if you'll find your device or your Bible there and open to Colossians chapter 2, it'll be our preaching text. Let me just say a couple of things. One, it was 31 years ago this month that Mary and I came to preach in view of a call to at this ch which would be this church. Actually, it was West Side at the time, meeting in Midland Adventist School. We were a mission off Emanuel Baptist Church in Overland Park. And so we did receive a unanimous vote, and we readily came, moved up from Oklahoma, began in February 31 years ago uh, to be the founding pastor here at Lenexa Baptist. So this has been really what I would deem my life work, what God called us here to build and to do, and it has been our love, and it will be our life legacy. Uh, just in case you're curious, I've, uh, since my retirement, I've been real busy. I have opportunity to preach uh, often. I uh, actually have done about six different interims in, in four different states, and so uh, I've kind of made it my motto, wherever he leads, I will go. And so we're preaching wherever God opens the door to do that, and we're grateful for that. And, and truth of the matter is, we're really doing what we believe God has made us to do, and that's serve the local church. Um, but I, I would tell you, I think we could all be quick to agree, there has really never been quite a year like we just experienced in 2020, and I'm glad it's behind us. And honestly, uh, even though it has been dim and, and we've dealt with a lot of issues, I'm optimistic about what God wants to do in your life and in my life in the future. For he who began a good work in us will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. It's him that makes all things new. Uh, I used to uh, use a little poem that I, I, I love uh, by Louisa Fletcher Tarkington. It's, uh, it, it goes like this. It's the land of beginning again. I wish there were some wonderful place called the land of beginning again, where all our mistakes and heartaches and all of our selfish greed could be dropped like a shabby old coat at the door and never put on again. You know, as I reflect upon this past year, there indeed has been a lot of heartache, a lot of hurts, a lot of mistakes, and a lot of disappointments that really needs to be left at the exit door of 2020. I don't know about you, but I always enjoy starting a new year. I've always been one that set goals for the year, and it's always nice to have a clean slate to dream and think what God would have us do in the coming days. And I know many of you already launched out uh, on your daily Bible reading again to read the Bible through in 2021. I'm happy to report three days in, I am up with my daily Bible reading, and I hope you are as well. <laughs> Don't fall behind. It's hard to catch up, I know. But anyhow, we began a new year together, and we, we do so in great faith and anticipation. And today, we, I want to talk to you about the year to come, really, as you would expect on this first Sunday in the new year about the importance of church in the year to come. The text that I'm going to be preaching from is from the book of Colossians, prison epistle written by the Apostle Paul, to a church that is located, uh, it was in Asia at the time, it's in, in uh, modern-day Turkey, and this epistle addresses some issues really that we, will, we are dealing with and have dealt with uh, in the 21st century uh, and he does what all that I know to do and what this church has been doing, and that's pointing you to the strength and the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Indeed, he is able. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. And so today as we look at uh, God's Word uh, and the importance of church in the world today, I, I would first preface what I want to say by uh, there are reports that, are, uh, that I believe are correct 
that says that in the last 20 years, the church in America has been somewhat on a decline. Uh, baptisms are down. Church influence is, has been on the decrease. Uh, Tom Rayner, who uh, heads up Rayner Research, says there's about 100 to 200 churches every week that close across America. And that was pre-COVID when that was, research was done. So we can only anticipate and guess what church life might be like uh, because I doubt if the trend is suddenly going to reverse itself. There is reason for concern. I, I, I saw this just a couple of months ago now, but it was done by the National Research Center that, uh, that said this, 32% of practicing Christians had not been to church since COVID began. And furthermore, they hadn't even watched their church online. And I tell you what concerned me when I heard that, is simply this. This may be a unique day in the life of many churches. And the problems may not be from the secularized culture in which we live or, or even our threats to religious liberty, but the problem itself could be found within our very own churches. It was Winston Churchill who said, there, uh, when there's no enemies within, the enemies without cannot hurt you. And who knows, maybe this has been a time of providential pruning, a divine separation from the wheat and the chaff. And honestly, with all of these concerns and challenges and criticisms, could I share with you this could be the greatest hour of the church. Listen, the church has always flourished in difficult days, during persecution and during opposition. Charles Spurgeon says, our troubles have always brought us blessings. They always will. They are dark chariots of God's brilliant grace. And so here's what I'm suggesting. While religion may be on its way out, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ will not be deterred by naysayers, opposition, cultural threats, or liberal politicians. So we come together today as we begin this new year in a unified front, agreeing that we're going to take the gospel to those who are without Christ because it's never been more needful, perhaps, in the year to come. So I'm standing to champion the church today, the local church, a band of brothers and sisters who are in Christ Jesus. We're the ecclesia, the called out ones of God. And I know that the church will flourish because here's what Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. So please stand on of reading God's Word. Just three verses today. We'll unpack these rather quickly, and uh, then we'll conclude. Man, I, great crowd today. I'm just uh, so thrilled to get to preach to so many, and, and, and thank you for being here. It's been a difficult day, uh, weather-wise and all, and, and thank you for being a part of our service today. Beginning in verse 6, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you or spoil you through philosophy or empty deceit. According to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of this world, and not according to Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, today I pray for a filling of your Holy Spirit. Help me to speak things that are right, true, that are edifying, that are encouraging, that build us up in our faith so, Lord, we believe in the church because what Jesus once was, we have become. We're the body of Christ assembled. And so, Lord, help us to love you as we ought. Direct our path as we open your word today. Speak to us as only you can. We stand on the promise that when we preach the Bible, it doesn't return void. It will accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Three quick things you're going to see in the outline as we talk about the importance of church in the world today, let's talk first about our unchanging purpose, our unchanging purpose. As a church of the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I are agents, we're administers, we're stewards of hope, because hope has its origin and its outcome in Jesus Christ. Certainly, the government uh, during the pandemic has de uh, deemed the church as non-essential, when I heard that, I thought, I thought to myself, is there anything more essential than hope itself? You know, it's been said that man can live 40 days without food. He can live three days without water. He can live eight minutes without air, but he can't live a moment without hope. But we give 
hope in Jesus Christ. I, I love what it says in 1 Corinthians 13, that great love chapter. It says, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. You know, that's the trifecta of the church, isn't it? Faith, for by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It's God's gift, lest any of us would boast. Also, there's hope. What's the promise of God? For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, not to harm you, but to prosper you, to give you a future, and to give you a hope. And all of that is demonstrated in you and I living a life of unconditional love. You know, nearly 40 years of ministry now, I've seen, and you've seen as well, a dramatic transformation in the way we do church. For a hundred years, virtually every church did church the same way. We sang from the same songs, from the same hymnal. We dressed alike. All the men wore suits and all the ladies wore dresses. Some of us are still wearing those suits, but just a few of us. But virtually every order of service, regardless, looked the same. And at the front of every church, you could tell how the church was doing because we posted what the attendance was a year ago and also the offering given on a, on a, on a, a plaque there at the front of the church. Every church had a piano. Some had an organ. But instrumentally, that's all that we had. And now we've got drums. We've got synthesizers. We've got fog machines. We've got multiple video screens. We've got church live. We've got church on YouTube. We've got church. Many of you are watching today via that, that very thing. And, and, and this is new stuff. And many of us who've been around, around a long time realize how new it really is. It hasn't been that long. We used to actually take an offering with an offering plate. But praise God, the offerings are still good even if we don't. Isn't that right, Jim? But all of these trappings have dramatically changed. But one thing that cannot and must not change is us compromising the gospel, the message of God's grace, which is able to save to the uttermost. Notice in the text, your salvation becomes real when you do this. Receive Jesus Christ as Lord. That's the undeniable origin. That's the genesis of being reborn again for anyone who will be saved. We receive Jesus Christ into our life. It's the only template we have. It's the only solution we know. It's the only message that we preach. It's the unveiled mission of the church. Honestly, as I thought about it, my ministry is not unlike my salvation. It wasn't something I achieved. It was something I received from the Lord. I wasn't worthy of it. I didn't have great potential or somebody seen me as some kind of diamond in the rough. And so I was saved or called to ministry. Conversely, when we give our heart to Christ, we do so because we're broken in humility. We receive him into our life for the provision of sin and the shame in our heart and life. And that can be transformed when we receive Jesus Christ, the Lord. Notice with me the significance of that glorious name. First, it says when we receive the Lord. That, Lord, that word Lord, Lord, excuse me, that word Christ first is the word Christos, which means the anointed one, the promised Messiah. We think about what that great confession Peter made in Matthew chapter 16. When he asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? He said, and they responded, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Jeremiah, Elijah, one of the prophets. And then he asked Peter, but who do you say I am? He said, they're the Christ, you're the Christos, you're the anointed one, you're Messiah who's come from God. He is the Christ. Receive Christ, you receive Christ Jesus, which is, is his given name. We read about that in Matthew chapter 1, the Christmas story. As the angel came to Joseph and said, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus of Nazareth. Born in Bethlehem, raised in the village of Nazareth. His name relates his mission. He came to save people. And then finally, his title, Lord, conveys his majesty. He is one who reigns in power and has authority and dominion. And when you and I say that Jesus Christ is our Lord, we're surrendering our lives to one who has dominion over us and authority over us. It's the purpose of the church to to tell people to receive Jesus Christ as Lord. And today, it's a little different in our church culture. Some are calling us to address social justice or to embrace the critical race theory. 
Some say we should spend our time advocating social change, but here's the problem. That's not our message. Our message is about deliverance from sin, about forgiveness of hardened hearts, about the grace and mercy available to one who will believe and can be transformed to be an agent of change in the world. Listen, the gospel message give us, gives us the capability to love as we ought for anyone and everyone, regardless of race or social standing or, pa- or their past. It's the gospel that enables us to care for others in their need because we are transformed from hatred to blame and blame to love and acceptance. It's the reason the Bible clearly says now there's neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free nor male or female, but now we're all one in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, Jesus will give you a heart of compassion. He'll set you on a course of loving, caring, giving, and he'll set you on a course of being a peacemaker. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Listen, the question for you is this. Have you been transformed by the grace of God? of God today. If you're watching me online, if you're watching me in the venue, I'm asking you today, have you given your heart to Christ? Have you received Christ Jesus the Lord into your life? You see, it's the gospel that changes us. It changed my life. Man, I think about my own heart and life, 1975, November of that year, 24-year-old young man in the hospital, convicted, fearful of death. I'd been there for an extended period of time. Disappointed in my own life, the direction it had taken, how I hadn't been what I need to be, and, and God revisited my heart. Sitting in a hospital room, I reached in the nightstand, I grabbed a Gideon's Bible, and I opened it providentially as it would be to Mark chapter 8, verse 36. It says, For what will profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What will he give in exchange for his soul? And even though I'd enjoyed success in the business world, And things on the exterior looked okay. My heart was empty. And I got on my knees and I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. And my life has been forever different. I'm telling you, your life can be different. He'll change your life if you'll receive him through a heart of belief. He'll give you the grace to move forward. Let me move quickly. Not only our unchanging purpose, but let's talk about our unifying practice. In verses 6 and 7, it says, we're to walk in him. In other words, we're to continue believing, progressing in the truth of the gospel that you and I would live as a testimony, actually a trophy of God's grace. Walking, obviously, is a picture of progression. It's not stagnant. It's not, uh, it, it, it moves. It's, it's di- excuse me, it's dynamic. And in the first chapter, in verse 10, he says we're to walk worthy of the manner of the Lord, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, thus How do we do that? Well, we're rooted and built up in him. Listen, I'm just telling you today, the building blocks of our life are coming together to make us more like Jesus because we've been predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, our Lord. So can I tell you, while it seems that the world may be falling apart, it could be falling into place for the receptivity of the gospel if you and I will do our part, if we'll stay tethered and anchored to Jesus Christ. See the word picture? Rooted and built up. Rooted like, like a, a, the roots of a tree which keeps it stable when strong winds blow and storms demolish everything around us. We're like a tree planted by the rivers of water, the psalmist would say. It's able to keep us stable and secure and we can remain at peace when all the world is going crazy. Let's be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You know, I, I ask you, is there anything worse than being some, around someone who's unstable? Someone who's a flake? Someone who is not sound of mind? Someone who cannot be trusted? And I'm telling you, if we are unstable, then obviously we're not rooted and built up in our Lord. Here's what I'm saying. This is the time when Christians must be found faithful. It's a time when we must not compromise. It's a time when we must not uh, compartmentalize our lives. Not acting and behaving like the pagan culture that we find ourselves. It's what the Bible clearly says is be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you 
may prove to do the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. I, I, three things I notice about this unifying practice. First, what unifies us is our faithfulness. Our faithfulness. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Consider us as, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. We're stewarding the gospel. And the very next verse says, Moreover, it's required in stewards, stewards of the gospel, that one be found faithful. Can I tell you, we're living in the days of apostasy. People who once seemingly walked with God now have gone the way of Cain, as it says in the book of Jude. I think about what I read about Joshua Harris, who was the lead pastor of Covenant Life Church and the head of Sovereign Grace Ministries. You may remember him because he wrote a a, a book a few years ago, sold a million and a half copies of a book entitled, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. But in 2018, Joshua said he was divorcing his wife. He said his life had taken a massive shift And he denied his belief in Jesus Christ and walked away. You say, well, pastor, what are we to say about these people? I don't know what to say about them, quite frankly. It's not ours to judge. But you know, the Bible does say a word of judgment. In 1 John 2, 9, it says, They went out from us because they were not of us. For if they would have been of us, surely they would have remained with us. But their going away proved They really were not of us. You know, I've said this before from this pulpit. Sometimes we put a little too much emphasis on how a person begins in the Christian life and too much neglect on how a person finishes in the Christian life. Oh, we've got to put emphasis on how a person begins. You can only begin the Christian life in repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. We've talked about that. But I'm telling you, you and I are called to be found faithful First, the thing that unifies us, we're faithful people. Secondly, let me suggest it's also not only faithfulness, but fruitfulness. What did it say in chapter 1, verse 10? When you walk worthy of the Lord, you'll be fully pleasing to Him. You'll be fruitful in every good work. What am I talking about in bearing fruit? I'm talking about the evidence of your life and my life rooted and built up in our walk with God. As Jesus said, I am the vine, you the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Can I tell you how critical your testimony for the Lord Jesus is in this day and time? You and I must live in a way that people are attracted to us by our love, by our grace, by our kindness. We'll never be an effective witness if we're only If we're ever pompous or have a holier-than-thou attitude, but an effective witness can be demonstrated by your love, your grace, your integrity, and your goodness. And can I tell you this? What's true individually is true as well in the church. I'm grateful to God that our community knows that this church cares. This church has been intentionally on the outreach right here in our Jerusalem. We've been seeking to care for the broken, the disenfranchised, and love the unlovable. We've been willing to overlook their fault for a greater good that we might lead them to the Savior. That's what this ministry is about. It unifies us, faithfulness and fruitfulness. There's another thing the text says that unifies us as well. Listen to this, and it's our gratefulness. Six times in four chapters, Paul brings up this attitude of of gratitude. Here in chapter 2, he says we're to be abounding with it. We're to be overflowing with what? With thanksgiving. Do you realize a hundred times in the Scriptures we're told to give thanks? Can I tell you today, suggest to you today, that thankfulness is a barometer of your spiritual health? I'm telling you, you lose your gratitude, you lose your thankfulness, you will soon be ineffective for God. It's not just a desired virtue. It's the mother of all virtues. And we're to live our life continually and habitually with a, with a sense of gratitude and gratefulness. What's the Bible say in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5? Rejoice every more, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Oh, can I tell you today, there's a lot of ways to get out of the will of God. There's a lot of ways. 
some of you know too well to which I'm speaking. But here's what will get you back in the will of God. It's your confession. It's your agreeing with God about missing the mark. For if we confess our sins, he'll be faithful and just to forgive us our sins. He'll cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Maybe you're out of the will of God because you've lost your gratitude. No longer thankful for anything. You spend most of your days just complaining. God help us to be grateful people. Let me quit with this. Not only our unchanging purpose and our unifying practice. Let's talk about our underlying problem because verse 8 says, See to that none of you are taken captive by philosophy, empty deceit, according to the tradition of men or to, uh, according to the basic principle of this world and not after Christ. I would suggest to you there's never been a more applicable verse in 21st century America than this right here. It begins with beware. Beware that no one takes you captive. It's a Greek word that meant to kidnap to commandeer, to carry you off, to plunder you as a pirate would commandeer a ship on the high seas. You know, one of the callings that every pastor has, and certainly that Pastor Chad is on a mission to do, that is to guard and to guide the sheep of our flock. There is a satanic movement of deception, of subtle teachings of teachers who will steal your faith, who will, leave you, who will leave you empty, confused, and cynical. Now, the word mentions here the philosophy of this world. Here, here's what it means. It means a secular worldview. A secular worldview is viewing your life, living your life, without interpreting what your life is about without God. Now, the word philosophy here, it's a root word, phileo, is a is the word for love, as you know, in the Greek language. Sophia is the word for wisdom. It's, it's loving wisdom. The wisdom that's being spoken of in this word philosophy is worldly wisdom, academic pursuits, ideologies of secular and atheistic teachings. Can I suggest to you today, it is what has turned the tide of this once great nation Secular teachers at universities and liberal beliefs now manifesting themselves in this growing disdainment for our country in pursuit of socialism and atheism. I'm just telling you, you walk in the university classroom today and you take a Christian worldview in there, you know what? You'll be harassed, you'll be laughed at, you'll be attacked. And the implication and application of what was written 2,000 years ago by the Apostle Paul, he called it empty deceit. He says it's false, it's fraudulent, it's of no substance, and it's toxic. The 19th century had a renowned philosopher by the name of Frederick Nietzsche. You remember the name. He made it a habit of mocking Christianity, and he deemed it a religion of weaklings. He was the first to propagate the idea that God is dead. But Nietzsche himself found no resolve in his atheistic philosophy. And can I tell you, tragically, he spent the last 11 years of his life insane. And I'm just telling you today, you lose your belief in God, you'll be a little crazy too. Still many today are deceived into believing that the only deity that's out there is themselves. It's humanism. It's the secular notion that's often propagated in the public schools or the workplace, the public square. And I'm just telling you, it's become the religion of America during my lifetime and your lifetime. You know what the Bible calls it? Empty deceit. The principles of this world without God. Paul would write in Romans 1 about man's rebellious heart, and he declares their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And the philosophy of this world has plunged mankind into the abyss of darkness. And now their eyes have been blinded because their hearts are hardened. And here's what I know today, people of God. It's never too late for a new beginning. It's never too late to be born again. If anyone and everyone will turn and give their heart to Jesus Christ, 
they can find their way. For in him, the next verse says, is all the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form in our Lord. Listen, this church cannot and will not fail because Jesus cannot and will not fail. And while Jesus and the church are not identical, I'm telling you, they're inseparable. We're the body and he's the head. We're the building, he's the foundation. We're the bride and he's the bridegroom. I can't imagine living my life without the fellowship of the local church. I can't imagine living my life without the privilege of knowing and loving God's people. But the answer is not the church. The answer is in the head of the church. You see, he's the head of this body. He's the foundation of our building. And he indeed is the bridegroom and we're the bride. Would you bow your heads with me today as we conclude? You may be watching online today and maybe watching in the venue or right here in this room. Maybe something that God has given to me in this message, the Lord has used to speak to your own heart. If I'm talking to you and you never can cite a time when you turned from sin and gave your heart to Christ, maybe, maybe today's your day to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and repent of your sins and believe in Christ Jesus the Lord. You see, this faith is focused <laughs> It's not just believing in things are going to be okay. It's believing in the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know him today? Maybe you need to pray a prayer. Dear Lord, come into my heart and life. Forgive me of my sins. Thank you. That in you all things can become new. And Lord, I need a new start. I need to get out of the muck and mire of the bad choices that have left me a long way from you. But restore me. Give me a new walk. Give me new life. I give my heart to you. You may be here and you've been on a slow drift away from the fellowship that you once had with God and Sin has made its way into your heart and life, and, and pretty soon you know it's the sin in your life that breaks your fellowship with God. But if you'll turn back to God today, I'll promise you he'll restore you. For those of you who've lived for years in sin, you know what the Bible says? That God will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten away. He'll make all things new. Come back home. Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. You may be here and looking for a church home. Boy, I tell you, you can't find a better one than this. They'll love you right. They'll make much of Jesus. They'll equip you for every good work. They'll stand with you and stand by you in your time of need. Father, this is your time. We have privilege to stand and say, Thus saith the Lord, but We're certainly dependent upon you, Holy Spirit of God, to bring about heart change. So as we sing this hymn of invitation, declaring you're the cornerstone, we pray that you would work among us as only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Staff will be here at the front. If you'd like to come forward and make a decision, we encourage you to do so. While we sing, God calls you come. While we wait.
Aren't you thankful for a faithful pastor who preaches God's word? I'm glad you didn't like retire to Florida or Arizona, that you're here in this beautiful Kansas City weather. Thank you too for braving the, the uh, conditions this morning and making your way into the building. I just want to remind you, if you came prepared to give a tither offering today, you can do so in those boxes that are placed outside the doors as you leave. For those of you who are watching and participating online, uh, you can give online as well. Lastly, before you go, next Sunday night, the most exciting business meeting of the entire year will be right here Sunday evening, five o'clock. We'll do some cool things like approve the budget, but most importantly, we're going to talk about what God has in store for the year ahead. And you'll be excited to hear what Pastor Chad has to share as far as some realignment and our direction for 2021. So you come next Sunday. Be careful on your way out. Thank you for being part of our worship. God bless you.